All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think we might begin. Right. Well, I'm Dimity Kingsford-Smith. I'm from UNSW Law, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all here to the FSI Consumer Outcomes Roundtable. And as you can see from the slide above, um, I have a wonderful group of people uh, on either side of me who are going to contribute to what I know from what they've told me already is going to be a lively and um, insightful conversation about the consumer outcomes chapter of the financial services uh, system final report. And just while we're on exactly what the recommendations were, there are two places in the handy little pack that the CIFA people have given us all where you'll find the consumer outcomes rec recommendations. And like Kevin Davis, I think I'm going to take this one home and blue tack it up in my office. It's such a handy thing. Um, and in a minute, I'll flick this screen so that you two can see them all up there as well. Now, today we have a mixed group. We have some people who are consumer advocates. Um, we have um, some academics. We have people from industry and industry associations. And we're covering the field in another way as well. Um, we have people who are involved with products, people who are involved with advice in the consumer space. Um, we've also got uh, expertise across investment, credit, and superannuation. We were hoping for a regulator or two and an insurance person, but we didn't quite manage to pull in uh, all the possibilities across the spectrum. But nonetheless, um, there's a, a lovely group of people here who are passionate about consumer matters. And um, looking down the line, I think every single one of them put in a financial services uh, inquiry submission, if not two. So um, they really have lots to say. Now, um, I'm not going to introduce them in the traditional way through their um, personal bios because there's lots of information in this book about each one of them. But I am going to uh, whiz quickly through the uh, interest that they've notified me of that they particularly have in relation to the Financial Systems Inquiry Report and um, uh, more widely. So going alphabetically, um, let's start with John Bacon, who's just here on my left. He's from the Financial Planning Association in Sydney. Um, uh, and his particular interest is in thinking about professionalisation as um, a mode of regulation that carries values with it, uh, values of customer service, client service, uh, and uh, values of fairness. Um, his um, uh, interest is in thinking about the life cycle of the financial citizen and how the financial services sector might serve the financial citizen through their life cycle. Uh, and going back to what Kevin Davis was saying this morning about the financial system being there to serve the capital needs of business, but it's also uh, the smoothing of income over a lifetime and uh, the capital needs of individuals as well. And he particularly is interested in us discussing today a deeper understanding of the substantive value of fairness um, in the advisory circumstances, but also more generally across the consumer sector. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce to you on my left here again, my UNSW colleague from the business school, Professor Hazel Bateman, who's done some wonderful work in the area of risk and actuarial studies, particularly on super, but even more particularly on um, financial literacy and behavioural insights, which have been very fundamental to the reasoning behind the report in uh, the consumer outcomes area. 
And her particular interest in what's come out in the inquiry is the increasingly complex financial decisions that ordinary individuals are required to make over their lifetime, their financial literacy, the behavioural research that she and her colleagues have been doing on the superannuation context in Australia, because it's wonderful to have these kinds of uh, uh, research outcomes that we have um, with Hazel's commentary that are about Australian circumstances. There's quite a lot of behavioural research that's about North American and European circumstances, but having it come close to home is always really wonderful. Um, she has a particular interest um, in retirement products and um, from the footnotes in the report of the uh, inquiry, I reckon that they relied quite a lot on her research. Jared Brody is also on my left over here. He's come today f all the way from Melbourne and we thank him for that. Um, he's from Consumer Action and his particular interest and expertise is in the credit area. And he's particularly interested in the report's shift in focus from informed consumers to fairness to consumers. Um, he is, um, sees product intervention as particularly an important aspect of that shift. Um, he's interested in consumer advocates uh, placing themselves as institutionalised voices within the uh, financial sector policy and regulatory space, introducing a consumer voice um, more uh, thoroughly. And um, it's impressive, I think, that the, particularly the two consumer advocates on this panel today, Jenny Mack over here and Jared, also made impressive submissions to the FSI about innovation in relation to consumers. And he's uh, raised the point also that product intervention powers may have a pro-competitive effect, which I think is an interesting point we might come to. Just here on my right is Professor Pamela Hanrahan from the Melbourne uh, Law School. She isn't uh, only an academic in her background, she was actually um, the Regional Commissioner for Queensland at ASIC and worked in their um, collective investment policy um, and enforcement area. And she's the leading academic on um, managed investment scheme and related uh, fiduciary and trust matters um, in Australia in the academic area. And she's also been a practitioner, uh, so she's got it all in that quiver of arrows there. She's interested, of course, in collective uh, investment schemes and um, professionally managed investment funds and pools more widely. So she can go in the super direction or in the non-super direction. Um, she's very interested in Recommendation 21, the design and distribution obligation. And um, she's interested in product intervention powers, which is Recommendation 22, but perhaps in a less enthusiastic way, I think. Um, she uh, is also interested in Recommendation 43, which is particularly about what happens when you have a business model or a legal structure for the delivery of a product which kind of comes to the end of its product life and what we should do with um, frozen funds and legacy products. Steve, thank you for coming. Um, Steve is from uh, AMP and the Executive Director of Financial Planning and he's had an impressive range of activities and titles um, uh, in the consumer area of the financial sector. And I've met him in previous occasions um, participating in pretty high level policy making. Um, and I actually thought to ask him today because he's um, interjections in those policy making discussions I thought were particularly thoughtful and impressive. As a start, Steve says that he is a, 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 a supporter of the pro-consumer approach taken in Chapter 4 of the FSI Financial Report and the um, recommendations made there. So that's um, a, a, a very positive position from which to begin a discussion about consumer matters in, with somebody from uh, an elevated position in the industry. Um, he is an advocate of consumers having an ongoing relationship with financial planners because um, they, he believes that they're better prepared both for the future in the short and the longer term. 
He thinks the best interest duty is uh, a very important departure in driving the improvement of the relationship between um, advice and consumers. And he thinks that the engendering of trust through such devices will improve the statistic that only one in five Australians access financial advice, despite the fact that all of us who've been in employment will have relatively large amounts of money to make serious and complicated decisions about um, for our retirement, at least, if not for more. Um, he also thinks that um, sometimes we try to overcomplicate the process of giving advice and that we need to have ways of delivering simpler advice to individuals throughout their lifetime because they don't always need complicated and very expensive delivery of advice. So we must think resourcefully um, about how to do that. And finally, um, he uh, is interested in the recommendations in the report for um, increasing the training and competence of financial advisors and other intermediaries in the financial sector, mandatory professional association membership, and generally um, improving the quality of financial advice and its accessibility to um, Australian financial consumers. And on my right again is Jenny Mack, uh, who many of you will know from her long and distinguished career as a consumer advocate. At the moment, she is the chair of the ASIC Advisory Panel on Consumer Matters, and she is also the chair of the Superannuation Consumer Centre. She's interested in two overarching issues from the FSI report. The first is the elevation of fairness as one of the philosophies underpinning financial services regulation in this country, and you've heard this morning how the underlying philosophies have changed from the Wallace settings to at least in the consumer space to include fairness as well as resilience and efficiency. Um, the second thing that Jenny um, is interested in in the report is the recognition of the need to apply learnings from behavioural economics to regulation and policy um, and giving fairness a greater weight in consumer regulatory outcomes and in a more specific way, um, product intervention powers and financial product governance obligations are examples of this recognition. There's a greater need to consider what products are appropriate for the retirement phase and how to uh, design them to uh, address the need for income and longevity risk in doing so. And um, she vividly describes uh, product intervention powers as giving ASIC much more flexibility in its regulatory toolkit and it's about whether we want ASIC at the bottom of the cliff or at the edge at the top uh, to hive off near misses. And finally on the innovation front in its uh, relationship to consumers, She's uh, interested in allowing consumers access to their data for personal use in uh, machine readable formats to drive the choice engines of the future. And she points out that in the UK and the US, um, things are going down that path and that um, if we don't think about that here, then consumers will be worse off. So that's where we start with our panel and their particular interests in the um, report that we're here to consider. Um, for the remainder of our two hours or so, um, I am going to ask the panel some cross-cutting questions and I'm sure because I know they've all got lots to say that we will have a lively conversation which we um, hope that you will find interesting and we'll do that for about an hour or so and then I propose to open the floor to questions from all of you um, to the panel for the last half an hour or perhaps 40 minutes if in the unusual event that we might all run out of things to say. So before I start asking the panel questions, um, let me pose uh, a sort of ideal type to you. How many of you have children in their 20s or 30s? Not quite so many of you as I thought. How many of you are in your 20s and 30s? Ah, look at them all. <laughs> My point in asking you these questions is that I think the recommendations in this chapter are for you. 
And for those of you who are you know, old and grey like me, they're for your children. We have a Wallace inquiry or a Murray inquiry every 20 years or so. We drop the settings into place and then we watch for the next generation, really, um, what's going to happen. So these recommendations are for you and for our children. And let's think about what those children might be like for a minute. They are probably 25 to 35, maybe. Maybe they're an architect or they're a creative doing social networking type advertising in an advertising agency. Maybe they're really lucky and they already own a small, small apartment somewhere. They probably have a mortgage. They'll have banking products. They'll have credit card. They may, alas, have credit card debt or phone card debt or phone debt. They'll probably be accruing SGC super. They might be thinking, if they're married or in a relationship, of starting a family soon. I'm going to turn it over to Hazel in a minute to tell us whether they can calculate a percentage accurately. <laughs> what their financial literacy might be like. Whether they're end users of products or market traders, because it does make a difference when you're thinking about consumer protection and consumer outcomes. What kind of risks will they be encountering during their life cycle? Longevity risk, for sure. Uh, risk of loss of property or income. Unfortunately, we don't have someone with insurance specialist on the panel, but I know that there are people out there who've got it, so we'll draw on you in question time for that risk. Do they have an online investing account? One of them might be in a social networking sort of online environment in their employment or in some kind of voluntary capacity, would they think of crowdfunding that social networking opportunity? So we th might think about, as we conduct our discussions, um, whether the kinds of recommendations we have before us, which are there, are the kind of recommendations which are directed to our 25s to 35s and how we might best implement them. So let's um, start our discussion um, by uh, asking the panel here uh, about some of the cross-cutting issues which went into the background thinking that uh, resulted in these recommendations. Financial literacy and the behaviour insights are what I have in mind. And perhaps I might start off by asking Hazel Bateman um, what she thinks the position is about these 25 to 35s and their financial literacy and how um, financial literacy substitutes for or might complement the recommendations on consumer outcomes and then um, anybody else on the panel who'd like to uh, follow Hazel is most welcome. Nice, yeah, thinking on my feet here. <laughs> Sort of. Um, I did point out that financial that I thought financial literacy was an issue when Dimity asked me for some uh, questions. And uh, in fact, this morning I noted both Kevin and Peter Mason talked, uh, and I don't know if either of them are here, but they both mentioned financial literacy as being important. But, and when you look through the report, and I can't say I've read all of the report, I was asked to do two things today, talk about retirement incomes and consumer outcomes, so I've read at least two chapters. Um, financial literacy is sort of assumed. There's nothing in there about how people might acquire financial literacy. 
And, and as we know, products over time are becoming more complex and people are having to make more complicated decisions. And I'm particularly focused on retirement incomes because that's what I work on. And, and over time, the sorts of decisions that ordinary people have to make in, reti in the retirement income space is far more complicated as well. So financial literacy is really important. Now, looking at our 25 to 35-year-olds, um, one of the things that I've done is um, there's been some international projects over the last few years looking at levels of financial literacy in different countries. And a couple of researchers in the US, Anna Maria Lasardi and Olivia Mitchell, came up with three key questions. And these three questions um, came from a, a much larger batch. And the idea was that these, if you were looking at the answers of these, uh, sort of could predict your level of financial literacy. And um, so with two other co-authors, Susan Thorpe and Julie Agnew, we actually did the Australian version of this. And so we ran a financial literacy survey to a representative sample of Australians in age 18 to the oldest people we could get to do an online survey. And there were three key questions, and you probably know these, but one is asking about people's understanding of interest, uh, compound interest, the other is people's understanding of inflation, and the other is people's understanding of diversification. And the measure that's used is to take sort of the average answer for the three. Now, in Australia, the uh, sort of the, on average, um, less than 40% or around 40% of people across the whole age distribution got the three questions right. And one thing that was interesting for Australia, and, and this compared very well with the rest of the world, actually. Now, if you were in Russia, probably 3% could get all three questions right. If you were in Chile, maybe 5%. Australia was higher than the US. I think the main countries higher than us were Switzerland and, and the Netherlands, I think. So 40% was pretty good. But one thing that was interesting was that financial literacy actually under those, that measure increased with age. And so our younger people were actually much worse at doing these things than our older people. Now, why is this important? Uh, because not only because things are more complex, we see in the real world, but in the academic literature, Levels of financial literacy predict certain sorts of behaviour. You know, so people are more likely to make better decisions. Uh, people are more likely to be involved in the share market. People are more likely to save more for retirement. People are more likely to understand things. Uh, so we might talk about the risk measure later, but um, how to disclose risk. And we've done some work in Australia looking at um, people's understanding of the risk measure that has to be disclosed in, in, in financial credit disclosure. People who scored higher on financial literacy were more able to understand what that risk measure was actually telling us. Um, so for everybody, financial literacy is important. Now, I've got a couple of caveats here. Um, we actually question these financial literacy questions. So I actually have a uh, funded project with ASIC at the moment, actually. So it's a project for this year. And we're questioning the questions. And we really want to ask, are there better questions that we can use? But uh, we think these questions are pretty good, but we think there's probably better questions that can be used. Now, how does this all fit into the FSI report? Um, as I said at the beginning, financial literacy is mentioned, but there's nothing in there on how we might acquire it. And in the consumer outcomes chapter, we talk about disclosure, um, and we talk about a greater focus on product design and distribution, we talk about product intervention, we talk about financial advice, but, but the, the missing part of that, I think, is financial literacy. And how do we actually acquire this? Um, and the second part of this is that products are so complex now that it's not just financial literacy that's important. People also need to understand a little bit more about the products themselves. And so how do people actually acquire that? And that's not really addressed in the, in the report. So I don't know if that's a roundaway uh, of answering your question. <laughs> Way to start. Thank you very much, um, Jenny Mack, and I might ask Jared also as well to perhaps follow on from Hazel and think about the kinds of financial literacy initiatives that might be important, and particularly anybody on the panel following them after, who might uh, say something shortly about the kind of product information that they think ordinary Australians should know about. I agree with most of what Hazel, well, all of what Hazel said pretty much, but I think the thing about financial literacy is it just takes too long. 
change in financial literacy is measured in generations. Um, so I think that, you know, yes, financial literacy is a good thing to pursue and we all would benefit from that, but we have to un look at the nature of financial markets in thinking about financial literacy as well. So, for example, the, comp the products are inherently complex. People are exposed to, you know, they're having to assess risk. Um, these are quite complex decisions. They don't um, have many opportunities for repeat um, experience. Like you don't really, you know, one mortgage, maybe two in your lifetime, um, one retirement in income product, you know, maybe two. So there's not a lot of opportunity for repeat learning. Um, and I think the other thing we have to remember, particularly when it comes to superannuation, people are in this market by force. You know, there is no choice. You are required to be in this market. And for some people, financial literacy is never going to be an, op an option. So I think there is a need to also make um, the products and the market um, safe for consumers. And this is where I think the uh, recommendation around fairness is particularly important because financial literacy, you know, will deliver some gains, but they're slow and they'll take a long time. And I think, you know, I'm really pleased to see that the report focused on other measures um, rather than saying, you know, financial literacy is the track we should go down. Um, because, uh, you know, Hazel mentioned some statistics and I know at one meeting with the, um, the chairman of the inquiry, he made the comment, you know, that he, he'd seen data that showed that 50% of people didn't know what 50% was. Um, thanks. I, I agree with a lot of um, what both speakers have said. Um, I, I guess uh, in terms of the financial literacy taking a long time, people might be aware that the ANZ have released, a, I think it's a four or five yearly survey for a number of years, and I'm involved in it as an advisory, an advisory way, um, and they're about to release their next, their next one. Um, it, it, I don't want to steal their thunder, but one of the, the strong findings on it is that financial literacy hasn't changed since they first started um, do, doing this surveying, you know, 20 years ago, uh, almost 20 years ago. Um, and I think that goes to Jenny's point that um, it takes a long time. Um, the other thing that um, the, 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 that research and other research tells us about financial literacy is that it's not just about developing knowledge, as in, knowledge and then applying it. It's also about uh, our attitudes and our personality it has a lot to do with how we make decisions. And they're things that are, um, are not easily taught. They're things that are culturally uh, ingrained, perhaps. Um, and, and one example of um, when financial literacy education perhaps has gone wrong, there has been some research that suggests out of, this is from the, the US, the, the Jumpstart big project they ran over there, where um, they estimated that providing people some financial literacy ed education actually contributed to worse decisions because there was an overconfidence. People thought they knew a little, um, but didn't know enough. Um, so they actually made the, 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 the worst decisions. I'm not saying that we should abolish financial literacy education. I think that it's a really important thing to, um, to do. And I, you know, a lot of the uh, work of, of the government through Money Smart and, and the banks in particular um, uh, play an important role. Um, I think that, um, uh, that, that any sort of financial literacy education, though, is struggling against the behemoth that is marketing. Um, marketing uh, uh, is out there to design us, to get us to buy now, pay later, think about it later, get the rewards now. Um, in, in that, that's, that the impact that has on cultural attitudes is significant. Um, and, and just finally, I think that any sort of intervention around financial literacy works best when it's targeted. So when it's, uh, um, people um, uh, don't really need just, or they, they struggle to engage with just general information. They more likely to engage with information when they need it, when they have a reason to apply it. Um, at my centre, we um, uh, have a, a telephone advice service, financial counselling service, we speak to around 20,000 Victorians a year. Um, and one of the changes we've noticed um, and over the last three few years was the change that was put on credit card statements about how long it takes you to pay off your credit card if you only pay the minimum monthly balance. Many people um, uh, mention that to our uh, financial counsellors, so that's something they've not noticed and it's actually making an impact on their behaviour because it's at a, at a time when they um, are, are, are trying to understand how to make the payments on their credit card. So I think that any sort of intervention has to be thinking about how consumers actually behave. 
Well, could I ask um, John Bacon and Steve Helmich, maybe both inter um, on the advisory side, to um, comment here on what kind of um, product information might be the next stage in terms of financial literacy? Um, thanks. Thanks, Timothy. Uh, let, let me sort of um, echo probably Jenny's comments about financial literacy. I think financial literacy is, is a great objective, but one of the reasons you don't get by it in, in Australia or around the world is people just aren't interested. They don't wake up in the morning and think about their superannuation. They don't wake up in the morning and think about their life insurance. So it's very hard to get people to do things and human behaviour comes into it, do things that they don't want to do. There's other things in their lives and that's, that's a challenge for us because there's no doubt if they were more financially literate they'd be better off, albeit they also take it that a little bit of information can be dangerous. I, I focus a lot on the best interest duty as being a real strong positioner for consumers to get strong advice from highly qualified financial planners in Australia and have better futures. But I also agree with Jenny's point that superannuation is compulsory in this country, you can't opt out of it. So because of that, they need to be protection and there needs to be simple products with simple disclosures around that. So I, I'm sort of a, of the view that we need to give the best interest duty time to work and apply some simple tests to understand it. For me, when a financial planner gives advice and, or they produce a statement of advice, there are just two things they should ask themselves before they give it to the client. Number one, has the client's interest been put first in this advice I'm about to give? And number two, is a client in a better position as a result of the advice? If both of those are yes, then we're on the track to a strong professional advice standard with professional advisors looking after clients and making consumers more confident for the future. John? Yeah, I agree with Steve and, and many of Jenny's comments too. I think um, in a way it comes back to this sort of fairness question. Um, we're asking people to participate in many cases on a compulsory basis at, um, in the, in, the, in the system, um, but if they're not equipped to do so, um, how is that fair? Um, uh, we're asking them to, compete, uh, to, to participate um, as a sort of a, um, uh, in a mutual sort of contractual exchange um, where one, one side of the party is, uh, one side of the, uh, of the bargain is um, uh, often ill-informed and, and um, doesn't have, have the full sort of, um, set of information in order to be able to make decisions. Um, I think it's great over the long term, and we should be targeting over the long term um, uh, improvements in financial literacy. Um, but as Jenny says, it, it, it is a very long, long term proposition. And what do you do in the meantime? Um, I think we've got to think about the role of advice, as Steve said, um, um, and assisting people to make guided decisions. Um, I think we've also got to help advisors to be able to advise, and we'll perhaps um, deal with that a little bit later, but um, uh, I think um, there are um, innovations in terms of technology as well which, which are helping. Um, advisors are starting to think about um, when I take a client on and, um, and I have to advise them in terms of best interest, um, I need to have a conversation with them at a level that um, they have an understanding of what I'm doing um, in, in order to get to a best interest solution. And that exchange of information between the client and the advisor is very difficult where the client just doesn't understand any of the basic financial concepts. So um, advisors are starting to innovate in term and, and um, people in the technology sort of sector and education sector is starting to innovate in terms of um, developing tools to assist bridging that gap between the client and the advisor. And I think that's all helpful innovation. Um, but I, 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 I still think that there's a, a really big role for um, advice, assisted decision making, the other sorts of options around default options and, and things like that are all sort of part of the big picture in terms of um, fair participation by consumers in the in in, in the financial markets, and uh, yeah, uh, it sort of comes back to a, a, a broader issue about um, um, you know particularly focusing on on where you started the conversation, Jiminy, around 
um, you know, the next generation of consumers um, in this space. I mean, whose system is it? Um, if people feel excluded um, in terms of their participation in the system, um, it, that doesn't help them make good decisions either. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much um, for those comments. Um, I think that um, along with financial literacy, that um, behavioural insights were very important in the formation of the recommendations in the consumer outcomes chapter of the report. We have experience with um, some of the products of behavioural um, thinking in um, financial regulation already in Australia. We have um, a my super default product in the accumulation stage of superannuation. It is proposed that we might have a SIPA default product in the deaccumulation or retirement phase of superannuation. We've had a lot of heat and perhaps less light about opt-in and opt-out of accounts in financial advising mandates there are other areas in which the sort of nudge regulatory toolkit um, has been considered and to some degree adopted. And as one of my um, academic um, compatriots in Britain likes to say, well, it might be nudge, but a lot of it's fudge as well. Well, uh, not all of us agree with that. And it's clear that the financial systems inquiry authors uh, didn't agree with it all either. What I think um, we might do now is just address to the panel generally um, a couple of questions that come out of the behavioural research and the beginnings, and we are really just at the beginning, of trying to think about how these insights can be used in consumer-facing financial regulation. Um, and I think there are two questions. The first question is, how do behaviour insights tell us whether or not to intervene? How behaviour insights might guide us about whether or not to intervene. And the second question is, do behavioural insights guide us in how to intervene? Because if you take the product intervention space that is before us at the moment, you can intervene along a spectrum. You can have product pre-approval. You can have default products. Um, you can have product intervention powers. You can have product risk ratings. You can have warnings and labelling, distribution uh, prohibitions, or you can just ban a product altogether. That's not a particularly uh, behavioural insight. But the point I'm making is that behavioural insights of various different sorts might take you in different directions along that spectrum. So I open it up to all the panel members um, to say something about those two issues. How do behavioural insights tell us whether uh, we intervene or not? And secondly, um, what do they tell us about how to intervene and what tool to choose? And Steve, do you want to start? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. All right. Well, I've just got to organise my thoughts for a minute. Well, just I guess at the you know, Dimity asked two questions: um, guidance about you know when you intervene, and I think you know when you see consumer behaviour producing unfair outcomes, I think that is a trigger to intervene. Um, and what the behavioural literature shows us is that you know, consumers don't always act in their own best interests. Um, you know, they don't read disclosure documents, and, and that's not because they don't care, it's because it's too complex, it's impossible to uh, compare, and as Steve said, there are people who, you know, there are times where people don't care, people don't live and breathe financial services like some of us might. <laughs> um, and even when they do read documents, they can't always understand them. 
And you know, disclaimers that are on um, financial services products are often very confusing to people. So I think you know we have seen examples of where um, you know maybe not consciously, but sometimes consciously, industry practices have moved into a space that exploits consumers' behavioural biases and produces unfair outcomes. And we've talked about add-on insurance, and I'm sure you've all seen the ASIC action against cash store. So, um, you know, where consumers were buying a product that they didn't even know they owned, but even if they did know they owned it, it, necessar it uh, there were instances where they couldn't even have um, claimed under that product because it didn't, they didn't fall into the criteria. So I think where you see unfair outcomes is a good place to intervene. How to intervene, I think there's, um, you know, what, what the learnings from behavioural economics have told us is reliance on information alone as a consumer protection outcome is not sufficient. Other, other areas are moving towards uh, new, well, but I'm, saying in, I'm not saying information is dead, rather we have to think about it in new ways. Like up until now we just provide the information, but that is not necessarily, people can't understand it, it's not helpful, it doesn't provide context, people can't necessarily interpret it. So there, there, so there are some avenues to think about new ways of providing information. But there are also things about to change, what we call change the choice environment, change the environment in which um, the information is presented to consumers. So one way of doing that might be uh, whether well, we've talked about opt-in, opt-out. So, uh, and in the last session, um, we heard about how the UK has moved to, to um, I think it was a ban on insurance being sold on a, an opt-out basis. So, you know, that's a classic way of changing the um, choice environment. Uh, controlling product distribution is, a, is, a, is another mechanism um, that we learn from behavioural economics. So, it might be that you can only promote particular products in particular ways. So, it might raise questions about whether it's appropriate to market complex structured products or contracts for difference on daytime television to that kind of an audience. Um, and then, well, the product interven intervention power, well, controlling features of products. Um, you know, it might be that products are designed in ways that, um, you know, exploit consumers' sort of mistakes that they make or um, just make it very difficult for consumers to act in their own best interest. So, you know, free to go into products, but very expensive to get out of products. Consumers will, won't think about the high cost of getting out because when they buy it, they don't think for a minute they're going to get out of it. So, I hope that answers your question. All right, I might say something about, um, one of the things that we really observe in this area, and it comes out of Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act, which as you all know, I think is the worst piece of legislation ever enacted, but we won't go there. People don't want to make choices where they have to hold more than three variables in their mind at the same time. And that's true if anybody's tried to decide what colour to paint the outside of their house or what kind of you know, curtains to have or whatever, once you've got more than three variables that you have to hold in your mind at the same time, it becomes really difficult to make a choice. So one of the things that we've been thinking about is um, the sort of diagnostic tools, for example, that are used by the medical profession when you go into your GP's office. So when you go into your GP's office, there's actually work that's been done out of the Harvard Medical School where they can ask you eight questions and they can get to about 98% certainty about what's wrong with you just off your answer to those eight questions. And the first one's how old are you? So, I mean, they're not questions that are difficult or time consuming to ask, but that's how doctors get down to a kind of refined choice model. So if we built a structure that threw out chapter seven that said people need advice, they don't actually need advice, they need relevant information at the time they're making a decision on a factor that's less than three variables, right? So if we can produce a system, whether it's technology based or whatever, where people ask a series of yes, no questions, and then at the end of that, in, they've gone from the enormous amorphous universe of financial services covered by chapter seven down to a simple set of yes, no choices at the bottom, 
then you can say to them, okay, well, it really comes down, the difference for you, the only th decision that you need to make is, for example, do you want to keep smoking or give up smoking? Well, here's some statistics on how much longer you'll live if you give up smoking. And then the choice is easy for people. But at the moment, with our disclosure-driven approach to regulation, we're trying to give people all the information that they might need in the universe, instead of being more effective about narrowing it down to get to the point where you can give them exactly the right piece of information that they need to make the choice that actually matters for them. Thank you. Well, I'd like to ask Steve yeah. to pop in here because um, he's an advocate gonna, of simplifying uh, things. Yeah, I am an advocate. <laughs> I, I, I want to pick up one thing around the, the, the essence around the smoking example. Yeah. Um, I, I find that people act when they've got a feeling of dissatisfaction coupled with a desire for a solution. And sometimes questionnaires only get them to the feeling of dissatisfaction. They don't do anything about it. That's why so many, sorry, you get my bias here, that's why so many people still smoke. They don't like it, most of them, but they still do it. Because there's nothing that's taken them into the desire for a solution. That's where I think the interaction with a financial planner, that wasn't going to be my first point. My first point was coming back to the sort of interaction's really interesting when you look at it from a product viewpoint or an advice viewpoint. I think interaction from a product side, I agree, if th there needs to be strong scrutiny of products to make sure they are fit for purpose for the consumers who are buying them and are simply understood and, and you know, really if you can't explain it on a whiteboard with a, with a, with a pen, it, it's too complex and, and that's one of the things I've seen. Ad advice tends to be harder and unfortunately it's why we've got to really drive, I think, a few simple questions like Pamela said around the best interest test to determine it. And I'm sorry to drag it up again, but if you had a look at the case around Storm Financial and you picked them and you said, you know, people knew the advice strategy they were doing, but if someone took them to task, say, in August 2007 and dragged them before the courts and said, this is all inappropriate, you would have client after client coming up from them saying, no, we're happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. And it's very tough. And I remember I had the discussion with both ASIC and the FBI at the time about how they could have taken action. Of course, you know, for the FBI, that's what professions do. They take actions before something goes wrong. And it's tough. And to this day, I remember talking to Bernie Ripple, there are some customers of Storm who still blame the federal government for its demise. It's because Manny Castamata was running a wealth cult. He was. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, let, let's, let's, yeah. Greed is a terrible driver of behaviour. Can I just, sorry, I'll just jump in because I was pretty close to the storm matter and it's interesting that you use the word greed because when you talk to the storm investors, there's some complicating factors around um, rural and regional yeah. investor behaviour, yeah. right? So there's an aspect of this which is a bit like Pyramid in Geelong or the you know, mortgage funds down in Gippsland or whatever. But leaving that aside, it's, it's convenient, I think, sometimes for the financial services industry to say, oh, well, people shouldn't... You know, if they're greedy and they're chasing high returns, they need to understand that, that involves high risk. But when you actually talk to these investors, what they're saying is, you know, I'm an independent person. I'm from North Queensland. I don't want to rely on the government. I want to look after myself and my kids. I want to have a good quality life. So I know that it's convenient to let the word greed <laughs> trip off your lips, but it's, it's where behavioural economics can actually add value to this debate is being a bit more sophisticated about why people make choices and it's not greed. Mm. No, I, I, I tend to agree. I think the greed was put in front of them, Pamela. I think they were tempted, is yeah. my point, rather than them saying, I want to be greedy. I think they were tempted by bad advice strategies. Yeah, is, yeah. Were. And we're also talking about the 25 to 35s. Yes, <laughs> um, I'll ask perhaps the three people on my right here, and certainly Jared and um, Hazel, who will work particularly in this area, to go back to these two questions quickly um, about interventions and perhaps when and how. And then I think we might move on to talking about fairness and the product intervention power. Um, I think, Dimity, in answer to your question, that uh, behavioural insights is most useful when we're understanding how to intervene, not just whether. I think. Um, I'll give three examples, and two of them actually relate to how we do disclosure. So I'm not always suggesting that we're throwing disclosure out. Um, the first one I think relates, it's, it's been talked about a bit already. Jenny mentioned the add-on insurance, and I know Peter did over lunch. One of the, uh, this has been looked at close three in the UK, and I think they've got a good model for their product intervention powers when they're linked to their market study powers. So this is when the regulator has a, a power to do an in-depth 
uh, study into a particular market, understand, uh, you know, uh, doing you know, research on consumer outcomes and, and what is actually happening in that market in depth, and then coming up with recommendations to improve market outcomes in a, in a pro-competitive manner. And so they, they did one around adult insurance. Uh, there has been a big scandal about the, the PPI in, in, in the UK. But one of the things they realised is that, as Jenny says, is that um, people weren't uh, turning their mind to the purchase of that insurance because it was all wrapped up with the sale of the credit or even the sale of the underlying product, um, often a car. And we see that in Australia too. Um, when you look at um, consumer credit insurance, the claims ratio is 23 cents in the dollar compared to most insurances which are 80, 90 cents in the dollar, um, which tells you that that's not a good value for money for consumers. Um, and one of the, the um, proposals they've put forward in the UK to, uh, it draws on behavioural economics. It's just to have a simple a gap between the time you can purchase, uh, when you purchase the, the credit product um, and any associated insurance that a consumer has, you know, a two day period, or I think they've got seven days in the UK, but it could be whatever, um, that they, they, you know, are not sold it straight away, but they've got a period to go back to that provider and, uh, and investigate that insurance when they've got a free mind and they're making an active choice rather than being something that they're sold at a time that they're not really got the uh, capacity to consider it. Um, another one is, uh, I think that's relevant is around um, insurance and there's a lot in the FSR report around under insurance. Um, and there's been a lot of debate, I know, in, in the industry at the moment about um, price comparison serv services and so forth. And I think that um, the insurers' objections to that are probably, uh, on some levels, um, quite valid in terms of these are complex products with many different restrictions and limitations on products, so they can't just be compared on price. Um, but consumers don't understand all those detailed terms and conditions. So is there a way to present disclosure uh, that's simple, and I, uh, it's often been said before, we've done it in food labelling, but is there a, a, a star system, for example, that you know if it's a five star product, it's going to cover all these things. If it's a three star product, it's only going to cover these things. And that might help consumers make better decisions. And I think that all these sort of things need to be uh, consumer tested to see if it actually helps consumers make better decisions uh, as well. The third one I wanted to mention was just about product use disclosure. Um, and so often disclosure is about product attributes, you're told what the fees are, you're told the interest rate, you're told uh, various aspects. But you're not told um, how you've, you've used that product in the past and how that might impact on your future use. Um, so I think credit cards are a good example. Um, being told a particular interest rate is not that useful if you always pay back by the due date. Um, you, you're better off, um, uh, uh, I think, uh, talking about other features. So I think that there's an opportunity to use that. Um, this is links, I guess, with the FSR recommendations around access to data. And if consumers got access to their transaction data over the last 12 months, including their repayment patterns, um, they could plug that into uh, a, a new disclosure tool to tell them what their actual cost of that product will be over the next 12 months. And I think there's opportunities to improve disclosure along that, that line as well. I've actually forgotten the questions. <laughs> the questions <laughs> are, um, does behaviourism tell us anything about when to intervene and what does it tell us about how to intervene? Okay. So what, what I wanted to do was actually relate it back to some of the things in the FSI report. Um, so as we know, um, consumers find it very hard to make decisions for a whole range of reasons, particularly if they're things they've got to think about a long way in the future, such as retirement saving. Um, and if things are complicated, they just don't want to make decisions. Um, and just tying it back to the report itself, you know, in the in superannuation chapter, we have a nice case of, it's not called a default, but it is really a default um, retirement income stream. And really this is, get, this is trying to get people to think about retirement income and not just retirement saving. And there's another part in the report, um, they talk about projections of benefits on statements. And again, this is, this is um, behavioural economics framing people's uh, superannuation, not just as an investment and as I've got so many hundred thousand dollars in my account, but what that account's actually going to give me uh, through my retirement. So getting people to think about superannuation as, as an income stream and not a lump sum. Um, another part's in the consumer outcomes chapter, um, disclosure, you know, there's, there's comments about trying to simplify disclosure because possibly one of the reasons people don't make decisions or make bad decisions is they just don't even read the disclosure statements because it's all far too much for them. So I just wanted to make the point that you know, I, I saw several places in the report where behavioural economics was used, 
But we have to be careful that that's not the end of the story. We don't want to pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, we've used behavioural economics in this report. We have to be careful what we do with this. So we have to make sure we design the default properly. Uh, with our benefit projections, we have to make sure that you know, all the, all the um, public servants and the regulators and the legislators don't make, end up with something so complicated that even it's on, if it's on our statement, there's so many assumptions associated with it, we can't understand what's going on. Um, and the same thing with disclosure. You know, we have to, there, there's probably many innovative ways that we can disclose information. But we have to be very careful that, that we're not just trying to be clever and that we really consumer test this, we have not just consumer test it and say, do you like this? Is this nicer than 200 page PDFs? But actually consumer test it and get people to use it and make sure that people are using it the way that the designers think they're using it. Um, and on that very last question about disclosure, we've vexed long and hard about how to disclose usefully to consumers for um, risk, because it's one of the hardest things to dis get um, consumers to understand. And I was reading something about um, disclosure in the consumer context in the European Union recently. And um, four countries in the European Union have come up with a colour-coded risk rating system for products. So if the product is actually simple and quite low risk, it's green, and if it's in the middle, it's a couple of different other colours, and then if it's a high risk product and complicated, it's red. And in Portugal, Spain, I think it's Germany and uh, Denmark, they have these colour-coded risk rating systems. Now, of course, they've come in for criticism because, you know, if you looked uh, ran the ruler over a Greek sovereign bond, it might not be in red, it might be somewhere else. But um, at least it's a start and it is the, ki the kind of uh, disclosure information that might hit harder than uh, something in 10 point font in grey on Bible paper. Now let us turn to fairness and fairness is important because as I mentioned earlier it's one of the um, step changes that the FSI brings in. The FSI says that fair treatment occurs where participants act with integrity, honesty, transparency and non-discrimination. A market economy operates more effectively where participants enter into transactions with confidence that they will be treated fairly. It seems to me that those fairness values are actually very much related to the provision of information. That in some ways those fairness values don't move us very much further on from um, anti-fraud values, proper disclosure and prohibitions on being misleading. So are there other fairness values? Are there values, for example, about value for money? In ASIC's complex products report, it makes the statement on the back of some very deep EU research that a very, very high percentage, of, it's got a 9-0 kind of uh, number in front of it, of complex structured products, despite all their bells and whistles and their fees and charges, give very little more than the risk-free rate of return over 20 years, despite all the risk. Now that seems to me to be a complex product with a value for money question mark over it. And we've been hearing about add-on insurance and there's payday lending and a number of other products that you can think of where the fairness question is more to do with value for money than it perhaps is with uh, the kind of information that you're given about the product in the beginning. So one of the questions I think we've got to think about in uh, implementing the fairness value in the um, regulation in Australia is how should this idea of fairness be used? Is it a justification for action? Um, is it a standard? And if it is a standard, how are we going to articulate the many and various meanings that fairness can have? Or is it an outcome? Should everybody uh, be treated fairly 
in some particular way or some particular context. Um, and also, values are often in competition with one another. We have resilience, we have efficiency, and we have fairness in the consumer outcome space should efficiency be defeasible to fairness. I don't think any consumer would want our institutions not to be resilient, but we might want to order the values in a different way in the consumer space.